Animals move. Let's look at locomotion. Be able to define muscle, bundle, fiber, myofibril, actin, myosin, M-line, Z-line, sliding filament model, sarcoplasmic reticulum, summation, and hydrostatic skeleton. As you see, this is mostly going to be about muscles. Be able to diagram muscle anatomy, including the terms from the largest to the smallest list of steps of muscle contraction. Identify roles for each component of a muscle in muscle contraction and compare forms of locomotion. Organisms need to move. Unless you are a filter feeder, you are living in an environment with patchy resources and you can move to go acquire those resources. If you have predators, moving helps you escape from them. It also helps to find new mates and some feeding mechanisms are highly derived on motion. Skeletal muscles are what we're going to be looking at in this lecture. So the cardiac muscles were more of the circulatory system and the smooth muscles were more of the digestive system, but this is the skeletal muscles. Bones are attached to the muscles and there are two attachment points to look at, the origin and the insertion. The origin is the part of the muscle that joins the bone and stays stationary. So the origin here for the biceps is on the scapula. The insertion is the attachment across the joint that moves. So the insertion is on the radius across the elbow joint. Muscles are organs and as such, they have a certain structure. The muscle is an is bound by connective tissue, it is supplied by blood vessels, and it has nervous tissue innervating the individual motor units. A bundle is a group of cells that is bound together in what is called a fascicle. They are bound together by fascia, which is a type of connective tissue. A single muscle cell is called a fiber, and that fiber has a bunch of myofibrils within it. A myofibril is a bundle of thick and thin filaments, also known as myosin and actin. These are organized in a certain way, such that they give Z lines and N lines. The Z line is where you have the actin, but not the myosin, and the M line is where you have the myosin, but not the actin. The space between two Z lines is called a sarcomere. So how do muscles work? Well, we're going to look at something called the sliding filament model. And this is where you have both actin and myosin and a myofibril. So where the actin and myosin overlap, the myosin heads are bound to ATP in their low energy configuration. When ATP hydrolyzes, you're going to get ADP and phosphate, and this will move the myosin head from its low energy configuration to a high energy configuration. If it is able to bind to actin's myosin binding sites, it will form a cross bridge, and then it will return to its low energy configuration. As it returns to its low energy configuration, the thin filament, the actin filament, is going to move toward the center of the sarcomere, and the sarcomere length will decrease. This can be repeated as ATP binds to the myosin head which is now in the low energy configuration and can start again. So let's look at that sliding filament model a little closer up with some electron micrographs. The sarcomere length decreases when your muscles are flexing. So you can see that myosin grabbing the actin and the contracted sarcomere is much shorter than the extended sarcomere. When many sarcomeres along the length of the fiber are going to decrease at the same time, and when many fibers are going to decrease in size, within a muscle, you're going to make the entire muscle decrease in length, which allows it to do work. Key within this is calcium release. I said if the actin can be bound by myosin, well, there is a time when myosin cannot bind actin, and that is when the myosin binding sites are blocked by tropomyosin. Tropomyosin is this protein that can block the binding of myosin to actin except in the presence of calcium. When calcium is present, this tropomyosin is going to slide a little bit and move to expose the binding sites. Well, when is calcium released? Well, it's released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which surrounds all the myofibrils. Think about your smooth ER and your rough ER. Now you've got the sarcoplasmic reticulum, or SR, to add to that list of organelles. Well, when does the sarcoplasmic reticulum release calcium? When there is a depolarization of the muscle cell. 
Well, how does that work? Well, let's look at the big picture. You have a neuron, and that neuron is going to innervate several muscle cells in what is called a motor unit. And when this neuron has an action potential, and the action potential reaches the end of the synapse, this is going to cause the release of acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. Acetylcholine will bind to sites on the muscle, and the muscle will depolarize. As it depolarizes, you get that electrical charge moving within the cell, and that electrical charge will stimulate the voltage-gated calcium channels in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. When these voltage-gated calcium channels are stimulated, they will release calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the cytosol. This calcium will bind to troponin, allowing it to show the myosin binding sites on actin. Myosin will bind, and the filaments will slide. After this, calcium pumps are going to move calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and that will cause the calcium to decrease, the myosin binding sites to be hidden again, and once again, the muscle will relax. The entire muscle does not need to flex at once. What you actually get is a bunch of nerves directly controlling skeletal muscles via motor units. The motor units is all the muscle fibers or cells that are controlled by a single motor neuron. If you want to pick up a penny, you're going to recruit several motor units. If you're going to pick up a barbell, you're going to recruit more motor units if that barbell weighs more than the penny and you need to use more muscle fibers. Recruitment is activating more motor units to increase muscle tension and muscle strength. Slow twitch muscles and fast twitch muscles are both part of muscle systems. So these are different types of fibers. And what you have is these different types of cells. Fast twitch fibers contract more quickly. They have fewer mitochondria and they're going to use anaerobic respiration. This is something for weightlifting. Although weightlifters are going to be breathing heavily, they're going to be breathing heavily between sets as they're going to be replenishing things for their fast twitch fibers. Slow twitch fibers contract more slowly, have more mitochondria, and use oxygen better. Your aerobic exercise, such as a marathon runner, is going to rely on slow twitch fibers. The percentage of fibers in each type of muscle are inherited. So you, if you have parents that are weightlifters, you are probably inherited more fast twitch fibers. If you have parents that are marathon runners, good news, you've got plenty of slow twitch fibers. And this also varies from species to species, which is why some species are very good in the sprint and some species are very good in long distance running. It's also why you have white meat and red meat. Muscle systems work in pairs with opposing movements. This allows antagonistic muscles to move things in opposite directions. And that allows a limb to move backwards and forwards as opposed to just moving in one direction and then staying there forever. Some muscle groups are gonna to work together to kind of create the same movement. Think about your pectoralis minor and major, they are going to create the same general movement, just a little, little bit different in how that movement occurs. Antagonistic muscle groups are allowing muscles not only in the mammalian system, but in the insect system as well, where you have extensors and flexors. And those are interior muscles with an external skeleton. They're still skeletal muscles because they bind to the external skeleton. The muscles allow movement of the organism, but what if you don't have a skeleton? Well, then you have what's called a hydrostatic skeleton. The alternating extension and contraction of these muscles squeezes against the fluid in the coelom. And this is going to be pressure against fluid that's going to squeeze the fluid around, thus moving the organisms. And you can kind of compare this with how the smooth muscle works in your digestive tract. There are different types of locomotion, and different types of locomotion are efficient depending on what the body mass of the organism is. And this is one reason we don't generally see very large organisms that are flying, because the energy cost varies. So the energy cost for smaller organisms is more efficient if you're flying than if you're running. The energy cost is lower if you're going to have a larger body mass if you're running or if you're swimming. 